All right. Um, here we are. I've, I've been avoiding doing this. I don't know why. Um, it's a short, very short. Um, and maybe that's why, because it's not um, really super relevant to the chapter. It is relevant to the chapter, um, but it's not super relevant to the chapter. Um, but it does, hopefully, the way that I'm framing some of these issues will help you uh, see the big picture of what's going on in this time period. Um, this chapter of our book, uh, chapter 15, is kind of a transition chapter. The one kind of substantive thing that it's talking about is the ongoing genocide of Native Americans. That's been kind of a at always at the periphery, I mean, literally, right, and, and figuratively at the periphery of westward expansion, um, but also at the periphery of the stuff that we've been learning about, um, where this chapter has the kind of big segment dedicated to that. Um, uh, and it's in this chapter because this is the time period where uh, effectively the ongoing genocide uh, uh, against Native Americans and the expropriation of their land is finally done. I mean, they will face you know, humiliations and uh, uh, attacks and, uh, and stuff like that, um, they will continue to after this period. Um, but wounded, as I pointed out, uh, wounded knee uh, and uh, little big horn is kind of the end of the end, at the end, that's it, right? Um, okay. Um, I don't know why I've called it the last West and the new South. All oh, right. I've called it the last West because I think the chapter talks about Frederick Jackson Turner, um, the frontier thesis. Uh, this is the idea that in the United States, the, the frontier is important to the American psyche, right? Just like, um, you know, England never being invaded, right? Since the Normans is a big part of the English psyche um, or the, revolu the history of revolutionary ideas in France as part of their right, consciousness. Um, so similarly, there's this idea that in the United States in this up until the 1880s, 90s, um, the frontier defines uh, uh, what it means to be an American. You can always go west, start a new, right, limitless opportunities kind of thing. Well, what do you do when there's no more frontier, right? Um, so that is the Fred, Frederick Jackson Turner's frontier thesis um, in, a, in a nutshell, as they say, um, just right in there. Um, let's talk about some of the other big ideas. And then the New South, of course, end of Reconstruction, they're back, you know, back at it again with the white supremacy uh, kind of thing. Um, okay, some of the big ideas. Liberal Republicans. So remember, when I say liberal, we don't mean liberal like we mean now. Liberal Republicans is like libertarian Republicans. Um, free trade, laissez-faire, small government. Well, small government in some ways, big, big government in others when it comes to supporting uh, the expansion of industry, big government, um, but not so much in, in other respects. Um, so the liberal Republicans take over the Republican Party, right? They're the kind of main uh, 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 force in the Republican Party in this time period. Radical Republicans being the other option, they get marginalized. Um, uh, no one cares about them anymore or their ideas. Um, so part of what they're doing, their liberalism, is like, we got the best stuff, man. We got the best ideas. We got industry. We know what we're doing. And everyone should have this. It's like, it's, you know, it's like proselytizing, um, secular proselytizing. Um, there was also like religious Christian proselytizing as a part of this. So they want to spread this progress around the world. This is where we get Seward, you know, the, you know, Seward's icebox with Alaska and all this pushing into Asia. We'll see more and more of this in period six, seven, eight, nine. Um, so internationally, they want to push out. Domestically, they have a rather conservative agenda when it comes to the stuff that Reconstruction was all about. Right, the, what the radical Republicans wanted. So um, the kind of classic example is the way that the 14th Amendment is interpreted to protect the uh, rights of, pro of uh, corporations, um, that corporations are corporate persons and that you can't violate their, their 14th, their due process rights. Um, this, of course, is a, being applied to railroads and to other industries that states can't, uh, you know, pass, un, you know, burdensome regulation. Um, this is not being applied to black Americans, right? So a rather um, backwards understanding of the 14th Amendment there. 
Um, gold and silver, this is ongoing. It's boring. Um, they find a bunch of silver out west. Silver kind of occurs naturally, right? This 16 to 1 ratio that's held fairly constant through, t like through time, like since the beginning of time kind of thing. Um, so this is seen as a solution, right, to um, the gold standard versus fiat currency. It, it, you know, it's boring. You read about it. Um, uh, uh, the land. Lots of land, and again, the ideology of this time period, the idea is that the, the land is there to use, right? You got to use it. Native Americans aren't using it properly. Um, whites will use it. So this uh, increases, right, a lot of wealth for um, uh, settlers, increases the national wealth, right, because they're plugging into a market economy where Native Americans were not. Obviously, ongoing displacement, genocide, expropriation, uh, um, of native land um, and then the beginning of I mean we have I mean climate change is a big deal right this is kind of with the especially with the internal combustion engine um, but we're burning coal in this time period it's kind of amazing you know that we can like destroy the planet earth in just a couple hundred years right so that's pretty impressive um, uh, track record there real real fast this happens real fast uh, and this is beginning in this time period Right. And we'll see the, the kind of the Great Plains as a classic example of this, that actually in the time period we're studying, we'll start to see environmental consequences of some of the decisions they make. This is part of the reason why Yellowstone and other national parks start to get um, national park status, protected status, is to like, well, come on, like, like, this is like pretty. You know, like, let's not de let's not destroy everything. Um, of course, the irony you know, and I'll point this out at the end of the lecture, the irony being that land is being preserved at precise, like land that was formerly occupied by Native Americans is being preserved at precisely the time that they're being kicked off of the land, right? Um, so there's that. Mining. Mining is the big one here. So I'll go through mining, railroads, uh, um, and then, you know, uh, cattle, crops. Um, Placer mining, again, what I said, what you all did in fourth grade, where you sift with the, you know, whatever. Um, in the early days of mining, it's fairly, you know, it's not to say there's not racial conflict, but there's white, there's Chinese, Mexican, all kind of mining in close proximity. The gold is, you know, uh, abundant enough where people are competing for the best claims, um, but they're not competing um, like they will later. Uh, you have in this time period a massive influx of Chinese immigration. You see here the numbers 1849, only 300 Chinese on the local census. By 1852, just three years later, you got 20,000 in California. And that's pretty much San Francisco and the, and the Sierras, right? There's not, nothing, nothing's happening in Southern California uh, in the 1850s, right? It's like just cattle. Um, so this, um, uh, with the increase of um, uh, immigration and the decrease of gold on the surface, you have to move from placer to load mining. Load mining is like blowing hillsides up and like hosing it down with water to find to separate the gold from the other kind of um, elements. Um, what happens here is suddenly it's not about competing over the best prospect. It's about competing over jobs, right? So the kind of conflict that we see in the industrial uh, Northeast is now happening in the West, right? Chinese against Polish, uh, uh, um, uh, Irish against German, Mexican against, uh, you know, whatever. Um, and all the while, right, the big mining corporations are, of course, they, they don't care. They don't care if it's, you know, a, a, a Chinese person in the mines or an Irishman in the mines. They're the ones making the money. Uh, and actually, that labor competition drives wages down. So all the better. So you have a kind of similar, you know, the West transforms from a land of like, right, striking it rich with placer mining to the same old conflicts we see back east. Um, obviously, the railroad is a big part of this history. Um, it is built with coolie labor, right? This is something that was developed by the British. The idea of just moving people around the world um, and uh, having them uh, do labor that locals don't want to do, um, or it's not paid well enough or whatever. So the British are famous for this, right? Moving people from South Asia to uh, East Africa, or moving people from Hong Kong to uh, the Caribbean. Um, that's all coolie labor. It's 
like slavery. Uh, and in some ways, it's almost, you want to say, almost worse. Um, obviously, nothing is worse than not having ownership over your own, like, self, right? So in that regard, slavery is the worst. Um, but there are so many Chinese immigrants coming to the United States that the railroad companies don't really care whether they live or die, right? And you have these kind of infamous examples of, you know, a group of laborers being snowed in in the high Sierras as the winter comes a little early and the mining companies just saying, oh, you like, whatever. Well, they'll just, we'll thaw them out in the spring um, and continue on with a new crew of people. They just don't care, right? There's so many people flowing, as you saw in the previous slide, from 300 to 200,000. Um, so, uh, obviously you can't have slaves anymore. So you have coolie labor, right? The railroads aren't going to be built by themselves. Um, a lot of Irish who are the like lowest of the totem pole of white immigrants at this time period think they're too good for it. They don't want to do it. So, right. Chinese are, uh, um, recruited to come to the United States. Um, so along with just, just this one point here, technological innovations, also kind of coincide with um, innovations in labor exploitation, right? Steamships or coal powered ships, right? Move faster than like frigates. You can't move a labor force around the world in a frigate. It's not big enough. It doesn't move fast enough. You've got to feed all those people. So coolie labor is an impossibility in 1800. You need to find a, a labor force that is cheap right? That's why we have slavery, right? Pack people on boats for the long haul across the Atlantic. A lot of them are going to die, but you season them and then you have a labor force. Um, with faster ships, you can transport people from China to the west coast of, Cal of the United States quicker, right? So you have this, this syn uh, um, uh, uh, syncretism between these two things. Um, Berlin Game Treaty encourages Chinese immigration. Um, it, um, right, European powers are trying to carve China up, right, Germany, England, um, uh, France, and Indochina. Uh, the United States says, we're not going to play that game. We recognize Chinese sovereignty. We'll begin diplomatic relations, normalize diplomatic relations, but in return, we want some of those, right, extra people that you have, and you got a lot of them especially in the southeast of your country, we want them to come over. And again, a lot of people are recruited under false pretenses, right? Oh, the labor is easy. You make tons of money. There's gold everywhere. Actually, in Chinese in this time period, it's Golden Mountain is what, uh, uh, what people use to refer to the United States as the Golden Mountain, right? So this idea that, like, it's going to be really sweet, right? You're going to make a lot of money, obviously, as you can see from these images in the background. It ain't necessarily so. Um, 1869... Right, Ogden, Utah, the Golden Spike, the meeting of the eastern and western portions of the railroads. Very famous picture here. Um, not one Chinese person uh, in the image, right? All uh, white folks uh, who are in charge of either the um, you know railway uh, cars themselves or the railroad. Um, I really like this image. It's about yeah, maybe a decade ago now. This was a recreation of that photo with uh, Chinese Americans who could trace their genealogy back to folks that worked on the railroad, right? So there's this big gathering of Chinese Americans to re reproduce. You see there the original photo with the you know glasses and everything um, to kind of reproduce the photo, right, with them in it, right? The descendants of the people that actually built the thing, right? So I've always th thought that this is a kind of, uh, this juxtaposition is very um, uh, interesting. Here's a not so interesting juxtaposition or interesting if you're like into racism. Um, uh, this is, let me give you my, cite my sources here. Um, uh, this is what it's from. Uh, uh, 1860, 1869. Um, the Great Fear of the Period. Uh, this is, right, Uncle Sam being swallowed by foreigners. You have to read this image. Um, the, Chinese, the stereotypical Chinese immigrant on what is the West Coast. Right, so we're looking at this image like we're a kind of giant standing in Canada, looking south. So this is the threat from the west. This, the stereotypical Irishman, is the threat from the east. You have here the tiny railroads crisscrossing. Of course, the fear being this problem is no longer uniquely an east coast problem, it can be a west coast problem, and vice versa, right? The Chinese immigrant can move to the west coast. And what are they doing, right? Eating Uncle Sam, 
eating Uncle Sam, and then eventually the appetite of the Chinese immigrant is is such where he even eats the Irish immigrant, right? So this obviously, you know, I mean, kind of like loony bins on the internet, like now on the internet, and like you know, have the old white genocide or whatever, like kind of moronic garbage people cook up. But like, this is not a new thing. Like this image here from the 1860s is effectively folks in the, in that time period saying like, oh, they're going to take over, right? They're, you know, they're going to, uh, they're ridiculous, right? So this is why we study history to see like a racist trope in the 1860s. It's actually kind of relevant, sadly, uh, to racist tropes in the um, 21st century, right? So, um, what a long, strange trip it's been. Okay. Um, oh, I'm just giving this all to you. No, I'm not giving it to you all at once, little by little. Um, Great American Desert, remember, is that middle part of the country. I went over this in an earlier lecture. Um, it's grasslands. It looks like, let's see if I can go forward here. It looks like this, right? This is actually pretty hilly. So, sorry, sorry. Edit this out in post. Um, this is actually pretty hilly, but not many trees. It's very, very windy. Doesn't get a lot of rain. Um, that's why it's known as the Great American Desert. Great for bovines. Bovines like bison, right? Bison are like cows, but they're like wild cows. Um, ranchers move in and they move cattle in. So much like Native Americans followed the bison and it was a kind of symbiotic relationship. The bovines eat the grass, they poop, fertilizer, new grass grows. The Native Americans hunt the bison, they eat them, right? Similar thing is happening with ranchers following cattle around, right? They move them from pasture, they go all the way to Chicago, right? Put live, live um, uh, cows on the train in cow towns, right? It's a word that is still used to describe like little podunk towns and they move them to the big cities right um, once the technology is such where you can actually cut into what is effectively an enormous you know several feet of root structure built up over thousands of years these native grasses um, uh, the homesteaders start to turn the ground upside down as the cowboy said right that like um, uh, there's a reason the grass is like that. There's a reason it's, you know, it, 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 it doesn't have a lot of trees. It's very, very, very windy in this area. And this won't be a problem in the 1880s or 90s, because once they turn up that soil, obviously underneath, it's incredibly agriculturally productive, right? It's like super rich in organic matter. By the 1930s, kind of is a problem, right? blows all the way, right? That's where we get the Dust Bowl, and we'll get in a later chapter. Um, so uh, this is the kind of like um, what's happening in the middle of the country. Native, I mean, you get it, man. I mean, you get it. You know, you read it. You know it. Don't forget it, right? Um, um, uh, it's not, and it's, it's a kind of ongoing thing in American history. Um, so the Lakota Sioux, are the big ones in this time period that resist. This is often in one of, in actually there's a map of the Standing Rock Reservation in your book. Uh, this is where there are still protests for like access to land. The Dakota Access protest from a few years ago happened on the Standing Rock Reservation. Um, uh, the United States doesn't like the ghost dance movement. They try to outlaw it. That's where we get the Wounded Knee Massacre. That's where we get the, um, the murder of uh, Chief Sitting Bull. Uh, uh, in um, uh, the Standing Rock Reservation. Um, same thing is happening in California, all these different massacres. Um, in, this, in California, it's miners, right, up in the high Sierras that are killing uh, Native Americans who had actually not that much contact with others out before this time period because the missions don't go up to the mountains. Um, and then this is it, like this is the time period where it's the end of native resistance to uh, these policies. Um, Indian Appropriation Act nullifies all previous treaties, so all bets are off. Dawes Severalty Act um, tries to eradicate Native American ways of life, civilize them um, uh, uh, in ways that is actually very detrimental to Native American culture um, uh, for obvious reasons, right? They have, this is their land for, you know, generations and generations. Um, and suddenly they're forced to live in little, right, in like, in prisons, right? Um, they don't like that.
right? Uh, and, and for good reason. Um, this is the irony of the time period, and this is the last slide here that I'll go through, uh, that at precisely the time that Native American resistance is, in, in a real way, is ending, at precisely the time that the United States is right, committing the last major acts of genocide against Native Americans, is also the time period where there's this, you know, emergence of fascination with Native Americans, with cowboys, with all of this kind of stuff, right? Um, at precisely the moment that one, Native Americans are being right forced on the reservations, and two, the cowboys don't exist anymore, right? Their land is being taken over by farmers, right, who are turning the ground upside down. Um, this is what one historian and anthropologist um, has called imperial nostalgia. Um, mourning the thing that you've just destroyed. So we see this all the time, right? People go into, you know, some pristine native habit, you know, wild habitat. There's native people there. They kill all the native people and then take all their stuff and put it in a museum, right? So you can like look and go, oh, wow, look how amazing these people were. Um, and this is kind of what's happening in the late 19th century. Um, well, Wounded Knee is happening, Massacre of 300 Lakota Sioux. You have, you know, Buffalo Bill being one of the most popular forms of entertainment. Um, okay, so again, Native Americans are still marginalized, they're just not massacred. Buffalo Bill's Wild West show kind of create a sanitized version, right? Annie Oakley, Buffalo Bill, all of this stuff. Um, and they're very, very popular in the United States, very, very popular in Europe. Uh, and this is kind of one of the ironies of this period of American history, and a lot of American history actually, um, that um, there is this imperial nostalgia, right? That like at the, like you're simultaneously like destroy, marginalized, subjugate a thing, and then celebrate it at the same time. Um, you know, so you can think about that when you're listening to your, you know, your rap music uh, 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 before you take the test. So, um, all right, that's it. Um, I'll see you uh, in chapter 16.